Welcome to the General Resonance Theory YouTube channel. Today, we have a talk with Alex Procht on alpha and gamma wave patterns in mice and its relation to anesthetics. We now join this talk already in progress. So <laughs> now, uh, um, some drugs are called anesthetics at um, a lower concentrations, uh, the ones that are not sufficient to make you unconscious or unconscious as far as we know. Other anesthetics, uh, notably ketamine, produce very interesting states uh, en route to loss of consciousness. So we have been uh, doing some experiments in trying to analyze um, EEG and all sorts of uh, perceptual behaviors in human volunteers. So these human volunteers, and I'll show you a video from one of them, um, uh, well, uh, they were exposed to several escalating doses of ketamine, starting from something akin to what people might be given for depression or for pain, sort of sub anesthetic dose, ramping up and then all, all the way to uh, general anesthesia. I believe he uses some choice words uh, in this video, so this is your uh, warning, but it's quite interesting to hear him talk about what his different experiences were on the different concentrations of anesthetics. From a sensory experience. Mm -hmm. So it was a separate, separate realm and I, I could still observe what was going on in this you know through my senses but it would be delayed it would be blunted it would be um attenuated uh so that was the first dose the second dose um i had i had open eye and closed eye hallucinations things were moving spinning and so on, um, felt completely floating above my body. And I, and I, I know that that's a symptom of ketamine and I, I wondered always what that would feel like. And I cannot describe it to you now, but, um, uh, you do get the pulse in the first dose. No, a little bit on the first dose. I did, I did during the face task. Mm -hmm. The face task is interesting because you you're so enveloped in this task that you become part of the movie, mm -hmm. and you're searching, you're you're literally you're one with the the gray and and black pixels. Um, I felt that the faces on the first dose were more uh, they were fuller, like they had. I'm just going to fast forward a little bit in the interest of time, and I'm going to get to the part where he talks about actually going under. Like, literally, like interstellar at the end when he's falling. You realize that you were not there. You were standing somewhere else. I was in, I was like falling along the side of, a, of an edge. Like, literally like interstellar at the end when he's falling in this like abyss of shit. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it to you. Say it. Say like, it you want. I'm sure I cussed a lot during this experience. But, yeah. I, I was, um, yeah, I was, I, I remember just, 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 I was, I started in the bed. I knew I was here. This was this was right when the second dose went to the yeah, third. Yeah. And then I was, then I plummeted down, like into a sort of like this big, uh, like in Star Wars. Anyways, so uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that anesthetics produce a whole range of uh, experiences. There's somebody trying to get in, and it has to be good. Mm -hmm. Right, a, a whole range of uh, perceptual distortions they provide, they give rise to all sorts of strange hallucinations where people describe looking at themselves from above or from elsewhere. People describe vivid dreaming under anesthesia. And uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that understanding what exactly these drugs do to the brain and what is the association between the effects of these drugs on the brain and on the various perceptual distortions that they produce is a good way to begin to hack away at what actually happens. What is the relationship between um, brain activity 
and conscious perception. So let me see it in advance, right? So with this kind of in mind, uh, of course, in humans, we can do very limited things as far as recording brain activity. Uh, uh, but uh, in animals, we can really get at, at the mechanist, at the more mechanistic understanding. So, I mean, ultimately, of course, everybody is curious about the hard problem of consciousness that is trying to relate uh, subjective private experiences of sensory world or of inner thoughts to objective measures of, say, brain activity or something else. And, you know, frankly, I, I think the formulation of this problem is not exactly conducive to scientific inquiry. So uh, what I will try to sort of tell you about is our thoughts on what sort of dynamical properties in the brain are necessary for experience. It seems like without which experience is disrupted, okay? And um, so, you know, uh, so this is, uh, I just happen to like this passage. It's a pretty famous one from Proust where he describes a sensory experience evoked by tasting a cookie. And of course, it's not really just about Madeleine. It's about the fact that this reminds him of his childhood and things like this. You raised your hand. You should just interrupt me. Okay, yeah, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, so um, in terms of what you mentioned about um, the key mechanisms for anesthetics, um, you know, we have had, you know, both last week and in prior Tucson meetings, um, a number of speakers talk about anesthetics and their role in helping to identify the neural correlates of consciousness in the manner that uh, Koch himself has defined it uh, over the years as being the parts of the brain that are necessary and sufficient for consciousness. So when you talk about identifying the mechanisms of anesthesia um, in the brain, would you agree that is basically akin or the same as identifying the NCC for the broader question of what's necessary and sufficient for consciousness? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, you know, I, uh, I don't think that, like, for instance, I personally don't really have a strong opinion about whether, you know, consciousness is in the back of the brain or in the front of the brain. That, that, that seems a little <laughs> bit silly to me. Uh, uh, the way that at least I choose to think about this is that the brain is some complex dynamical system and we can uh, record uh, aspects of brain activity from different places, but really uh, it is in one state at a time. So, and that state changes over time. So in, uh, in that sense, you can, you know, it's possible that you might identify features of brain activity that are correlated with specific sensory or perceptual experiences, but I don't think that that is necessary. That is only really necessary if you sort of assume that there is a representation, that there is, you know, some physical object in the real world, and this object is sort of mapped onto brain activity. So uh, I don't know why that necessarily has to be, and why these correlates have to be fixed. So for instance, if I am seeing, you know, this picture right now, as opposed to I look at this picture, you know, 10 years from now, would uh, Christoph say that I have the same NCC? I'm, I'm not so sure. I, I don't think I don't think that's clear at all. Does, does that sort of answer your question? It does, yeah, and it's really interesting. And let me ask a follow-up there. So I, I have had this kind of growing and very nascent intuition that matches what you're saying, that it seems that maybe the main game is the overall pattern uh, produced by the brain in any given moment. Um, whether you characterize that as, you know, the neuroanatomy um, and or the EM field produced by the neuroanatomy. And if that's the case, then would you agree, and I know this is a big question, would you agree then that the reason why we're having such a hard time finding this, you know, kind of fairly basic question of the front of the brain, back of the brain for the NCC and the current you know, adversarial collaboration between IIT and GNW is that perhaps, as you were suggesting, I think that the question is, is kind of a misguided question, that it's actually not about the neuroanatomy, it's about the overall pattern of the brain and brains can be different shapes and you can even have, you know, complete lobotomies of the PFC and still have similar patterns produced by the brain's EM fields. Would you agree with all that? Does that make any sense? Actually, uh, I was talking to George Mashur about uh, this uh, at, at the meeting, and I was even thinking about writing something along these lines. I mean, 
you know, the very fact that it took the people who are sort of the, the godfathers of the two theories being compared a long time to figure out what is the difference between their predictions, I think is telling. And I think the only difference that they absolutely agree upon is that one says it's in the back of the brain, the other says in the front. But if you really think about, say, the general tenets of IIT, it doesn't say anything about the brain at all. It just says something about any system that represents information. And there is, you know, and I guess you would have to ask Giulio Tanoni, but I think if you ask them, and I said, well, I have this device that is made out of transistors and wires, and it has hi-fi, or I'm looking at, you know, some correlated waves on a surface of the water, and they have hi-fi, he would say, well, yeah, don't those things are conscious. So in fact, the distinctions that they're focusing on in this adversarial collaboration, to my mind, are not necessarily foundational to the theories themselves, right? So that, that's kind of my take on it. I, yeah, that, that's kind of what I think. I think, you know, my thoughts about this are probably more aligned with like Walter Freeman's and Varela and, and, and sort of that tradition. That's kind of the way I think about it. And well, that is because, you know, uh, I studied, say, individual cells, right, individual neurons. And while it's a very natural thing to do to try to describe their behavior using differential equations and understanding how various currents fluctuate as a function of time and voltage and whatever else, it's a very natural language to talk about how the brain works at a physiological level. So it would be appealing just from those grounds alone to have a similar language that describes, you know, experiences that are uh, uh, that are at least related to the dynamics exhibited by the brain. So, I mean, my conceptual framework, I'm going to skip this because you guys know all of this probably, but it is this kind of uh, uh, broad conceptual foundation is that really uh, when, you know, an animal or a human were engaged in some behavior, really what is happening is that the brain is not in isolation, it's not in a vat, Okay, it is interacting in a bi-directional way uh, uh, through the body with the environment. And, uh, you know, if you also sort of take a, even a further step back and say, well, you know, why have the brains evolved? Why do we have brains to begin with? Well, they certainly didn't evolve uh, for us to write novels or to do neuroscience. They evolved for us to uh, uh, be able to live in this world and be able to survive, right? And in that sense, the selection pressure is really on the system as a whole. It's not just on the brain. It, the brain has to be constrained such that it can respond and anticipate environmental situations and uh, produce behaviors that sort of match the situation on the ground. And in this case, there is no real obvious meaning to the state of the brain at any one moment in time, except for how will the state evolve in the future? So that's kind of the tenant, at least as far as I'm concerned, of sort of a dynamical take on perception, consciousness, cognition, things of that nature. So that's kind of the, I would say the philosophy slide, and then we can get into the data. So maybe we should, uh, is this kind of clear? Do, do I need to clarify any of these things? Okay, so I'm gonna take silence as, uh, as an indication, yeah. this is really reasonable. Okay, so I mean, well, so this is maybe related to Tom's question, like what, what is dynamics anyways? Well, you know, if you look at, for instance, at a pendulum, you might say, well, I can measure a whole bunch of things about this pendulum, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but dynamics uh, is concerned mainly with uh, 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 predicting or modeling how the state of the system evolves as a function of time. So, of course, you know, I could plot you the position of this pendulum as it swings as a function of time, and that would be a sine wave. I could also plot you the velocity that this thing will trace a function of time, would be a cosine wave or something like that. But the way we typically think about the system is like this. We say, well, it turns out that I need to know two things about this pendulum, its position and its momentum. So, therefore, I can represent the state of any pendulum in any possible situation as a point on this plane. In other words, this spans the state space. So presumably, 
If I wanted to describe the whole brain as a dynamical system, I would need to know what that is, what are the different variables that I need to know to describe how the brain will evolve in time. Of course, we don't. And then I will need another ingredient in the mix, and that is if I know the state at any one moment in time, I need to know what's going to happen at least over a very short period of time. So that's kind of like drawing an arrow here. And if you imagine iterating this process many, 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 many times, well, you can maybe for a pendulum, you would trace out the trajectory of looks like a circle. This is for an ideal pendulum. Okay. And um, you notice here that these laws of motion, they take in the state of the system, which is position and velocity, and they also have some parameters here. And that's really what I'm going to talk about in the first part of the talk. What should these parameters be? But as I've told you, you know, I couldn't write anything resembling an equation like for Newtonian mechanics in a pendulum for, for the brain. That, that would be very, very difficult to do. So, but nevertheless, and this is, I guess, where inspiration for some of the things uh, we are doing comes from is some, at this point, pretty old work. Uh, and I'm using a work from Varela as an example, but there are several other people who have produced similar sort of observations. And the idea is that when uh, we perceive a certain stimulus, it's not that this happens in the back of the brain or in the front of the brain or in the middle of the brain. It happens because um, neurons in different parts of the brain become somehow synchronous. They become a part of what Varela and other people would call an assembly. So, uh, and uh, uh, this assembly is very transient. It lives for a very short amount of time. And then as you're having your next experience, or maybe there'll be the next assembly, et cetera, et cetera, and these assemblies would uh, succeed each other. So this is uh, one of my personal favorites. Uh, uh, this is an experiment done on people uh, who were shown pictures like this. And you can probably all recognize that this is a face with a contrast that is blown out. So this you know, faces are very meaningful stimuli. In fact, we've done some experiments in face perceptions on ketamine that was quite intriguing, but I, I won't have time to really talk about it. I don't really analyze the data. Or this kind of picture, which I think most people would look at and see just swatches of black and white. But of course, in uh, reality, uh, this is the same picture, just turned upside down. Okay? So the whole idea was to <coughs> present uh, these kinds of stimuli where this, this kind of thing has an intrinsic meaning to us as people. We learn and we know to look at faces from early on in infancy, and we pay great attention to them. And uh, what these guys have done is they have recorded EEG, okay, in patients while they were watching these pictures. And um, these little circles on the head are different electrodes in the EEG. And the line connects them if the two oscillations that they record to different uh, electrodes were correlated, okay? And if there is no line, it means they're not correlated. And again, I hope you can see these snapshots at different moments in time. I'm sorry, I forgot the time axis here, but the bottom line is, there is a transient formation of this very large assembly of correlated oscillations when the person sees a face. And this does not happen when they just see something that doesn't really make any, any, any obvious sense. It doesn't mean anything. Okay? Alex, do you recall what the primary band is for those correlations gamma. of oscillations? This is gamma. So gamma, gamma, okay. The, the, this is gamma. Uh, in the 40 hertz range, of course, you know, all these magic letters that people attach to oscillations that uh, we have slightly different meanings and different things. So this is EEG. And in this particular case, this is gamma oscillations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, and just, you know, in case uh, you're sort of not, you don't think of, I mean, I know you guys do think about oscillations a fair bit, but just to be sort of clear, what is meant here is a correlation in phase. So in this case, uh, there's a pretty clear phase correlation to things. Uh, the peak of one follows the peak of the other by approximately the same amount of phase. And in other cases, there isn't. Okay. And uh, this is what is meant by correlations here. Alex, I wonder if you could speak to this. So clearly there's a, a component of conscious experience that's associated with the recognition of the woman's face versus uh, experiencing squiggly lines. But in another sense, I, I phenomenologically, I feel equally conscious in both cases. It's just that the consciousness is a meaningful configuration in the one case and a, uh, an abstract one in the other. 
That's right. That's right. That's right. No, I, I agree with that entirely. It's not that people who were watching these pictures are unconscious in some sort of color police. They're, they're very much conscious. Uh, and, you know, and again, you guys think about this kind of stuff more, more than I do, but you can imagine if you're looking at uh, the squiggly lines and they don't grab your attention, you don't, they don't mean anything to you. Maybe you're thinking about something else, but you're not really engaged in the task. And when you do this over and over and over and over again, you're essentially averaging across a myriad, very different mind states, brain states on every trial, and all the correlations wash out. I don't mean to imply that this is a hallmark of consciousness. This is the thing you can isolate in a very simple experiment when you do it over and over and over again. If, if you guys work on EEG, you know these are really, really noisy signals. It is very, very hard to say anything about them on a single trial. And uh, well, I'll show you some work in mice that is done on single trials, but that requires a, a bit more finesse with recording and just better recording signal. You know, but yes, that's a very good point. I entirely agree. Okay. Good. Thank you. So, uh, but this kind of at least this meaningful perception, so it's claimed, is accompanied by these uh, large scale uh, uh, um, synchronizations between oscillators that were otherwise more or less independent of each other. Okay. Another question there, Alex. Yeah. Um, this again, pretty good question, but um, do your best here. Um, w w so, for example, the green gamma uh, blob in the top. Um, <laughs> perception. W would you agree or disagree that we could say reasonably that gamma blob is the physical representation of that conscious percept? Uh, you're trying to make you step far outside of uh, sort of being a scientist and more <laughs> into the world of philosophy. Um, well, um, this is what I personally think. I mean, I don't think this experiment tells you, right? Because, you know, what you're doing is you're correlating two things. It's very hard to say, you know, if it actually is a meaningful correlation or not. But I think intuitively it makes a whole lot of sense. Certainly when we think about just acting in the everyday world, uh, most of the things we experience, they have some meaning to us. I say, oh, I recognize, uh, I'm sitting in my room or my kid might wander up the stairs at any given moment. You know, these are not just visual images. These are images that are connected with memories, with meaning. They come through different sensory modalities. So it does make sense to me that uh, in the brain, uh, uh, in order to unify this conscious experience, uh, uh, activity has to be somehow coordinated. And I think, uh, 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 Tanoni, for instance, would say essentially uh, the same thing. This is kind of integrated information. The emphasis is a little bit different. And I think it influences what kind of questions you ask. But I do think that, uh, yes, I, I would have to say that if I had to bet uh, that conscious experience is associated with some sort of a coordination of brain activity rather than any any specific area of the brain activates. So for instance, and this is, uh, Christoph Koch has done this uh, early on in his career. He showed, for instance, that, you know, if you record from the primary visual cortex of an animal, uh, neurons are tuned to very specific features of stimuli. But if you start playing psychophysics games, you can show that activity in the primary visual cortex is not really related to uh, conscious experience. And in the very end, I would allude to some recent papers from Stan Dehane, Dehane and Peter Rolfsman's group that show that what is correlated is this kind of large scale integration concept. So yes, I, I, I think so, but I, I don't know if this, this can be claimed as a, as a finding versus a conjecture. Does that, is that fair? Yeah, yeah. All right, very good. So, uh, right, so, well, uh, so what I wanna ask next is like, well, this is highly non-trivial. How do I get these oscillators that live in very different parts of the brain and don't even necessarily directly talk to each other? How do I get, how do I get this, like, this large scale activity that percolates across the brain that can sort of engage all of these different neurons, right? So uh, I'm gonna to return to my pendulum and I'm gonna 
change the state. Of course, this is this is way simplified, but I'm hoping it illustrates it. Okay. So imagine that this state is kind of a viscosity, okay, of the system, right? So if, uh, my pendulum is swinging through molasses or some such thing, and I push it. And if it's swinging through molasses, I push it, and yeah, it might swing uh, one or two times, but then it's going to come to rest, okay? In other words, this system is stable. And to make it a little bit more formal, it is stable because all perturbations very quickly damp. That is, uh, uh, the effect of perturbation doesn't have a chance to percolate across different components of the system and doesn't live for a long time uh, in the system dynamics. You can imagine uh, a converse case where you know my pendulum is at rest and I push it by the most uh, uh, microscopic amount, but then through some sort of feedback amplification, this, this perturbation grows without bounds. So you would call such a system unstable. And uh, perhaps this is something uh, akin to what happens during seizures, actually. Okay, so this kind of very simple-minded reasoning should suggest that well, maybe stability of brain dynamics is something that the brain should care about. If the dynamics are too stable, then no stimuli will perturb brain activity. If the dynamics are too unstable, then any amount of noise will make the system unworkable. So perhaps uh, somewhere. Goldilocks zone between these two things is what uh, what the brain should want to do. Okay, fair enough. All right. So the first tests of this idea uh, came from experiments on uh, primates. Uh, so uh, these primates uh, we didn't do the experiments; we just analyzed the data. So, but these primates were implanted with what are called EKG electrodes. It's signals that are similar to EEG, and uh, here I'm showing you some examples of this kind of business. But they're much more, uh, much less affected by artifacts such as volume conduction through the cerebrospinal fluid and disruptions through the skull and the muscles and whatnot. So still not individual neurons, uh, but uh, sort of a finer scale recording of brain activity. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a little chunk of this activity and we're going to fit it to a model. And the reason we're doing this is because obviously, I alluded to this earlier, is that we, we don't know what kind of equation to even fit to these data. It's unclear, right? But maybe if you took a, a, a chunk of data, very, very small, and in this particular case, we chose at 300 milliseconds, maybe you can still approximate it as a linear system, okay? So that's the, that's the hope, uh, and uh, that's our kind of assumption, which we know is not strictly speaking true, but it is pretty much the only thing can be uh, somewhat reliable. Okay. And the reason why we did this is because at each moment in time, in each little window, we get a matrix. And this model uh, describes what you would call a resonator, basically a thing that will ring with different spatial temporal modes. Each mode will have a temporal frequency. Okay. It will have uh, some projection onto the electrodes, like meaning which electrodes are engaged and what is the relative phase of each electrode. And uh, uh, most importantly, it's also going to encode in, this is something called an eigenvalue, but it's going to uh, uh, reflect how robust these oscillations are. Specifically, if this lambda is less than one, then any mode will, then this mode will decay, okay? If lambda is more than one, then the oscillation will grow in amplitude without bound. And if it is about one, well, that means the system is close to a critical point. So our hypothesis predicts that uh, uh, this lambda for the awake brain should be close to one. Okay. What what is v what is v bar? V bar. Oh, so this is uh, yeah yeah yeah. So this is uh, 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 the vector. So uh, uh, we have 128 electrodes. So at each moment in time, we have 128 numbers. So v arrow is the is a vector that has as many components as there are electrodes, and each component is the voltage recorded at that electrode at that moment in time. And this uh, uh, matrix uh, uh, relates the previous electrode to the next. Got it. To the next state of the electrodes, right? So you're trying to model the system just one step, one time step in, in, in the future, right? And in this case, a time step is one millisecond. Okay, so very very short interval. In time. Okay, but, uh, and you're assuming that uh, this relationship of Vt to Vt plus one is linear 
and is unchanging for the duration of a window, which is about 300 years. Okay, good. All right, so this basically describes how this vector will rotate in space and in time. All right, good. So yeah, so when we did the analysis, of course, I wouldn't be telling you this if this properly flopped, but uh, it didn't flop, right? So uh, each column here is a moment in time during which the monkey is awake. It's before it's given any kind of drugs. So we have every reason to believe that the monkey is awake. And uh, the color shows how many eigenvalues were there at any given parameter here. And you can see that most of them are around one. Okay, so that was nice. And uh, here, actually, they've injected uh, different kinds of anesthetics. I'm showing you an example of one of them. And um, as much as you can tell, again, the monkey lost consciousness in that if they tried to you know, push on its fingers or something like that, it did not respond. That's, that's as good as you can do. And when that happened, uh, the dynamics became much more damped. Right? You can see that the eigenvalues now peak here, rather than here. And the number of critical eigenvalues decreased. Uh, yeah, and in fact, a lot of this decreased since somebody asked about uh, the frequency, most of the decrease was in the higher frequency range around gamma. Uh, with equal G, you get a broader dynamic range of signals. The EG really attenuates signals that are the higher frequencies. In equal G, you can get them, so, but higher frequencies were more attenuated. So, and we have done this in a number of different ways. Uh, we have done this with different anesthetics. Uh, we have done this um, in uh, humans uh, that are undergoing epilepsy surgery, so they get implanted with several electrodes. Um, and uh, in every case, we can show that the dynamics are stabilized. And this measure that uh, distinguishes between dynamics in the awake brain and the brain that is unconscious uh, behaves better than other conventional things that you might want to measure, like, for instance, is there more or less of a particular form of oscillation, like say gamma or solar oscillation, things like that. Okay. So to show that that's the case, uh, you know, again, I sort of showed you with the early videos that, you know, you know, if you wanted to have surgery, you want to be pretty sure that you're unconscious while the surgeon is performing the operation. You don't want to be aware of any of that, and you'd want us to guarantee that that won't happen. And the reality is, absolute majority of people are in fact. Unconscious. I don't want to scare anybody in case you guys have to have surgery or something like that. It's very, very unlikely. And usually when it happens, it's a mistake that somebody made. But nevertheless, it happens. So it's interesting to see, can I detect, uh, can I distinguish between brain activity that happens in the awake brain from the brain that is anesthetized? And we've done this here. And that's the blue curve. This is the error percentage as a function of how much time we're given the model. So. You know, probably if you're alert and awake for more than a couple of seconds, you may remember that. So ideally, you want to catch these episodes quickly. And you can see that if you uh, give it about a second of data, the classifier is almost perfect. Uh, in contrast, if you try to do it based on conventional measures, that's the green graph, it doesn't do so well. And uh, we're better off by about three orders of magnitude or something like that. So that's a, that's a pretty big difference. And uh, if you start messing with the signals, just to, you know, you just scroll back, and you see uh, if I just take a channel and I shift by a little bit relative to another channel, and I do this for all channels, so I preserve all the phase correlations within channels, and I also preserve pairwise correlations between channels, so shifting them by an arbitrary amount. But all of the higher order, so sort of the bigger macroscopic patterns, would get destroyed. So if I do that. Of my classifier performance goes down. So that suggests that this kind of um, uh, stability analysis uh, really captures um, uh, uh, so these higher order correlations between multiple signals. And th that's kind of, a, uh, um, th that sort of sums up this little part of the talk. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with these data, this is uh, Marcello Massimini's work. And he started out in Tanoni's group when uh, I think this is when his first paper on this subject was published. And what they have done is they've taken people in a normal wakeful state and they ping their brain uh, with a magnetic pulse, transient magnetic stimulation. And again, this is done over many, 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 many trials. These pings are pretty weak. My understanding is that uh, a subject doesn't really detect that something is being done to them. They might 
feel a little bit of a weird sort of sensation, but this this doesn't really make them unconscious or anything like that. And if you do it in an awake uh, person, you will get this oops, sorry, get this very sort of complex pattern that develops much of the brain. But if you do it in a person who is say naturally asleep, you get a much simpler pattern. And they've again done this in a number of different settings, including anesthesia and including sedation, and also including uh, brain injury. Uh, and in fact, uh, Massimini's result uh, uh, is very closely related to our results because if there are many critical modes, modes that can be excited by stimuli, you would expect that the response of the brain to a stimulus would be complex spatial temporal pattern. Whereas if most modes are damped and they're not uh, able to be excited, then you would get a much simpler response. So we don't have a formal connection to Massimini's result. But uh, you know, if I could clone myself and do multiple things at once, I uh, would actually work a little bit on this. And uh, Marcella and I talked about it, but I think we're both a bit too busy to actually undertake this. But it seems like these two results go together. Okay. So I mean, so far I basically said uh, that uh, um, you know when we perceive a stimulus, uh, uh, there is this large scale of integration of brain activity but it doesn't tell you what those macroscopic patterns are, right? It just means that there are oscillations that are correlated, but is there an overall structure to this pattern of correlations? And that's the latest work by uh, DT. And this is done in mice, but these mice were implanted with the similar kind of electrodes as was done in monkeys and some additional ones as well. And they cover much of the cortex. And I'm gonna be talking about responses to very simple stimuli like a flash of light shown in visual gratings and uh, flashes on the screen, but this is nothing, not like a naturalistic movie or anything like that, very, very simple, okay? And uh, uh, yeah, this is sort of the map of the electrodes and you can see that they cover most of the brain. This is the back of the brain, the cerebellum. This is roughly where the primary visual cortex would be. This would be parietal areas. This would be like the mouse equivalent of the hot zone for consciousness, a la Tanoni. And this is the frontal cortex, which would be the hot zone for consciousness, I'll last time the hand, okay? And these uh, little um, diamond shapes here are places where we additionally place electrodes through the cortex, where we record individual action potentials, individual and things like that. Alex, just okay. to be clear here, is this image of the, the mouse brain um, flipped 90 degrees? 90 degrees. Well, mouse is looking up in this case. So if uh, yeah. eyes would be here and nose would be pointing out, right? So this is the cerebellum. I mean, mouse cortex is very, very different from human cortex. They don't have salsa and gyri. You know, what uh, counts for prefrontal cortex in a mouse is a matter of some debate, you know, uh, but nevertheless, they are the living creatures that run around in this world. They're able to see, although their vision is not nearly as good as primate vision, but yeah. So this would be auditory cortex would be somewhere here. Uh, right here would be motor and premotor cortices of the mouse. There will also be an olfactory bulb, which is huge and rodents and kind of tiny in us. Okay. Right. So mouse is looking up. This is the bottom of the brain. So this is sort of the left hemisphere with the mouse looking up. Okay. See, the thing is tiny, and this is one millimeter. So there's not that much real estate inside the mouse brain. Okay. So uh, and we record oscillations in the brain uh, during uh, the, the stimulus, right? So, uh, and these oscillations happen simultaneously at different frequencies. So, uh, when we looked at uh, uh, coherence across trials between these different stimuli, we noticed that uh, the signals were very consistent in two different frequency bands. One is uh, gamma, which we define as 30 to 50 hertz. But, you know, the exact numbers for these cutoffs are probably not super important. And another one, which happened at three to six hertz, and uh, I saw you sent me a link from Bozaki. Yeah. So what uh, what uh, what the frequency of different oscillations is is not also necessarily conserved with different species, depending on the size of the brain uh, and the amount of connectivity in the brain oscillations are different frequencies. So some people say and i'm not going to push very hard on this because i don't think it really matters but some people say that uh, the equivalent of alpha oscillation in humans is a rodent oscillation between three to six hertz and there is a lot of work on eeg on alpha oscillations it's 
pretty much the most famous EEG activity signal. Okay. Can I so, ask a question there? Huh? Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, so again, I agree it doesn't really matter, particularly what we call these bands. But I am curious um, if you follow the work of um, Bagur and Benchanane and also Bizak has done a lot of work in this too, looking at the role of theta as a carrier wave for higher frequency um, frequency bands. And so, for example, um, Bagur and Benchanane looking at theta as a carrier wave for gamma in um, visual perception, et cetera. Would you suggest in this case, in your experiments, your work is suggesting that alpha is what you're calling alpha is the carrier wave for the faster frequency gamma, or is it a different relationship? Yeah, yes, let me just, uh, I'll skip through some of these things and uh, show you the slide that very directly. This is, um, so there's a lot of uh, work, uh, mostly in the hippocampus on theta. And frankly, what Buzaki would call theta and what we're calling alpha, they're nearby frequencies. So I, I don't really know if there's a clear neurophysiological counterpart. Uh, distinction between these two oscillations, maybe just exactly where they occur. But this is an example of the carrier wave sort of idea, right? So this is these are these are two filtered versions of the same signal. Okay, this one happens to be in the primary visual cortex. Okay, this one is in the parietal cortex, right? So you can see that okay, there is this uh, well, let's just call it three to six hertz to be precise oscillation, right? And you can see that the faster oscillation peaks at the peak of that wave, right? It's time locked to it. So this is uh, amplitude modulation, phase amplitude coupling. So in fact, if you plot the amplitude of the gamma wave as a function of the phase of the theta wave, you get a peak. In this case, the right smack at zero, which is the peak of the sine wave, okay? And in a different location here, uh, uh, there's also a coupling in that this distribution is not uniform, okay? But the peak occurs at minus pi and pi, which of course in phase are, are equivalent, right? So this one happens at the trough. So yeah, absolutely. So uh, our results are very, very much consistent with this idea of nested frequencies, right? And that idea in general has a lot of support, okay? Because if you look at say the power spectrum of most brain activity signals, they're what's called one over F noise. So one consequence of that is that no matter how you zoom in, you pretty much get the same looking uh, signal, right? That there are all sorts of oscillations at all different frequencies. And, you know, the, the, the faster oscillations are rising on the slower oscillations, right? So, so waves within waves within waves, you know, up to a certain limit, of course, you can't really pick up things that are too slow or too fast, but yes. And a follow up on that. So Again, this, I'm, I'm kind of speculating based on prior prior work here, and then I think your work may support this. Do, do you think this is good evidence for the notion that um, gamma or, or sorry, theta slash alpha, the slower oscillation acts as a carrier wave in terms of creating synaptic units for perception? So this is a, an explicit um, idea in Berger and Benchanay 2018 and a special issue where they say this is like probably how um, perception and memory work is that basically the slower waves act as on, almost like a train where like e each, you know, the train car of, you know, data packets that then are carried by the slower waves. Would you agree with that kind of model in a general sense? Right. No, I absolutely agree with that. And, and uh, that, uh, and uh, you know, um, uh, that you have to basically, uh, uh, this is how I phrase it, okay? You know, when you're recording this kind of a signal like EEG, on this case, it's local field potential, but uh, the difference is not uh, that critical. You know, you're recording uh, a mixture of things, right? You can't, you can't really assign uh, each component of the wave to a very specific phenomenon that is happening in the brain, okay? But you can still say some things. So a duration of an action potential in a vertebrate is about one millisecond. So if you were to detect a, a, an action potential, you should have signal at about thousand Hertz. And you don't have that in the data, in the LFP, right? Because action potentials are very noisy, you know, different neurons, they don't fire at exactly the same time. So that kind of stuff falls out, okay? So what happens at the frequency of four, 10, 15 Hertz well, that's roughly commensurate with the duration of the synaptic potential, 
Okay, so it is, uh, you know, and there's a lot of biophysics and neurophysiology work. There's a nice review actually of this kind of business by Buzaki and Koch, I forget which year, uh, but uh, I can send you the link if you guys are interested. But our, yeah, I think, I think that sounds right. I would say about 10 years ago, but goes through and really tries to lay out why that is. So uh, that's exactly right. And uh, again, we can, uh, maybe I'll save this for later, but yes, in short, I agree that uh, the slower components of the signal are probably mostly synaptic connections. They're probably some admixture of biophysical properties of individual dendrites, but it's not final. Whereas the higher frequency oscillations are probably related to, uh, high, to firing of neurons right underneath the electrode. Fair enough? Yeah. Thank and you. this, by the way, is, uh, you know, so we compute this modulation index, which is sort of how entrained is the fast oscillation uh, by the slow oscillation. And uh, we compare it to many versions of shuffled data that is shuffled in very sort of, we take, for instance, uh, this this fast signal from one trial and try to align it with the slow signal of another trial and do it a gajillion times to see how likely are we to get a distribution this non-uniform, right? And uh, uh, if it doesn't pass muster, we color this electrode gray, but otherwise we color it by the strength of the coupling. So you can see that in most of the brain, the two oscillations are coupled, okay? And this shows the phase of this coupling where you know, what is the peak uh, of the slow wave at which uh, uh, the fast wave occurs? And you can see that that varies systematically across the brain. Right. So uh, yeah, that's right. Okay, so uh, the basic point here uh, in this slide is that, look, I can filter the signal at gamma, in this case, at these two different locations. This is the visual cortex, this is parietal cortex. And you can see that they both have gamma, the gamma is increased after the stimulus. That's good. That's that's all well known. But you can see that it's not independent. Okay, you can see that there is a phase lag between these two electrodes. Specifically, when this one peaks, the other one trumps. Okay, and you can see the same exact idea for uh, these slower signals. They're in present in both electrodes, right? And you can see that it's it's also they're not precisely aligned. This this time it's a, a little bit less of a phase shift, but nevertheless, it's not the same way, okay? And we can show this quantitatively by showing the distribution of phase angles between these two electrodes. And you can see that the distribution is highly peaked. In one case at uh, 180 degrees, as we would expect from here. In another case, it's a little bit less than that, okay? And uh, that is exactly what was plotted in the Varela slide, right? If this distribution is essentially peaked, they draw a line, but th th they don't look at what, what the phases are. Okay? And that's what, the next part of this is going to be about. Fair enough? Okay, good. So, well, uh, it's sort of complicated because we have this signals that oscillate at each electrode and the electrodes form a 2D grid. So it's a little bit tricky to visualize all of them all at once. So but what I did here is I just take a column of these electrodes, okay? And I'm going to plot you the signals filtered at these two different frequencies in this column from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. So here, if the voltage is positive, you get a, a black uh, coloring. And if the voltage is negative, you get a red coloring. And each one of these squiggly lines is a particular electrode along this line, okay? So again, it's pretty clear that this thing forms a wave that sweeps along from the back of the brain towards the front in the gamma frequency, okay? And you can see that this wave lasts for a couple of cycles. Okay, and then it dissipates. Okay, uh, if I plot it further out, it would look just like this here. Okay, and if you do the same thing, but for the slower uh, oscillation, and again, uh, we just want to emphasize the spatial properties here. So, um, you know, uh, right, so we, I can plot you enough, but you can take my word on this. If I plotted this further out, uh, you will see that that wave also kind of descends back into the maze, okay? So this again, this for now, I'm just talking about signals that are averaged across trials. And what we do next, we will uh, 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 remove that constraint and we will do things on a single trial level, okay? But on average, you see this, and uh, look, there's a huge difference in time scale. So this thing right here, it's only plots you 100 milliseconds of the data. 
this is 400 milliseconds. Okay? So if you plot them together, you can see that there is a fast sweep uh, from the back to the front of the brain and a slow sort of reverberating echo that projects back. Okay, so that's what this pattern looks like. Okay, so fair enough. Anyone? Good. So if you want, I can go through the math here, uh, uh, which I didn't in Tucson because obviously there was a really no time. But we came, you know, uh, when you're recording these signals, you're not really guaranteed that every aspect of the signal is related to the stimulus, right? And that's why people average across trials. But we didn't want to do that because, of course, you know, your subject doesn't see an average of 100 stimuli, it sees every single stimulus. So the idea is that if this, if this means anything at all, I better be able to pick it up on every single trial. Okay, good. So, uh, but you can imagine, uh, I mean, I'll just tell you how we did this. Imagine we have data like this, but on a single trial uh, level, okay. And uh, what we do is we do some, something called singular value decomposition, which instead of looking at each signal individually, looks at correlated patterns of signals. This is something very similar to what people do on ocean waves. If you want to describe how a wave propagates and you're recording you know, height of the water at different locations, this is kind of what, what you would do. And then we identified a single one of these modes whose amplitude increased after the stimulus. Okay, and now we can, on a single trial basis, say, does this wave look like we think it should? And these are the results, okay? So in fact, uh, as we sort of promised, based on average data, the thing, the fast wave propagates from the back of the brain towards the front. And you can see that this is not, like we're calling it a wave just because we need a word, but like an ocean wave would not curve like this, right? Uh, it would go straight. It could be a radial wave or something. This is more like a rotating wave type picture, right? But you can see the other one, the slower one, goes in the opposite direction, also curved, but essentially these arrows are about opposite of, of the other ones, okay? And you can see a little bit of this here. You can see that if this was a regular wave, then uh, as I move each unit in space, I should move the same unit in phase, but it's curved, it's sort of an S shaped type of business. So are they curved? Sorry, go ahead. Are these, concur are these concurrent or are they sequential? Well, uh, this is them superimposed on one another. They are happening at the same time. These are two waves that are two different filtered versions of the same signal, right? We, uh, the local field potential contains many, many, many oscillations, and most of them don't appear to be entrained by the stimulus. So we're only focusing on two temporal frequencies that we've shown are entrained by the stimulus, right? There is a whole lot of other signal that we're just not looking at at this moment. Okay, uh, uh, but yes. Actually, Alex, just yes. To follow up on that. You yeah. you referred to um, the the uh, backward part as being an echo, and yeah. I'm wondering if even if they're going on in um, uh, parallel, if the if the return has any relationship. To the uh, to the feed forward one, if that is this, is there some sort of bouncing back? There's some sort of. Um... I'd like to claim that very much. That's what I think. Uh, if you dig uh, under the hood in the math, you know, uh, and this, you know, this has to do with some fundamental properties of wave. The better I know the frequency of the wave, the less precisely I know when exactly it occurs. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is some temporal smearing that happens. Okay. So yes, that's what I think. No, I did not say that in the paper, nor can I, nor am I allowed to claim it. But you know, really just following up on that, is there that seems like an important idea that would be cool to test if you could. I'm wondering if you could introduce some sort of signature into the feed forward one that might be. Uh, revealed or carried over into the return one. So just as an echo, you, know, you can hear the voice of what the person said in the return. Maybe there'd be some signature that you'd hear in the return. 
That's right. Uh, we're actually lo looking to, I mean, this took a long time to figure out. <laughs> so this is still uh, pretty fresh uh, off the press. So I, I'm uh, really happy to hear thoughts about this because this is new to us. Okay. So yeah, exactly. Like what happens if you give two stimuli? Do they interfere with each other? Mm. You know what I mean? Like uh, uh, what I would like to claim in the end, and maybe I should save these claims for the end, is that you know, instead of thinking about, you know, neural correlate, like this stationary thing that happens every time I shine the light into a mouse's eye, instead, maybe it's this wave-like creature, right? And maybe we should think about, think, you know, think about thinking, uh, think about what happens when you're actually in the world, when you're not seeing snapshots one at a time, when you're seeing sequences of pictures that are incredibly complicated and your brain is able to make sense of them on the fly, that is because the properties of this wave embody something about expectation of the next stimulus or something something like that. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of where we are going with this. No, I'm not allowed to claim this. And yes, that's, that's what I think. And the idea of using a perturbation of some kind is a very good one. Mm -hmm. uh, because these are mice, we can also hack into their brains and mess with different neurons and um, things like that. So yeah, that's, this is where this is going, uh, uh, I hope. For that, I need uh, more money, I think, mm -hmm. more tools. But yeah, but that's kind of the idea. That's right, that's right. That's a very good point, okay? So uh, I can show you pretty pictures, okay? So this is what uh, the, the gamma wave actually looks like on the brain, okay? And here you're gonna see a timer ticking off and zero is when the stimulus arrives. Okay, so that's the stimulus and you can see it sort of goes up, but then you see there's a weird reverberation and that's, uh, that's when the, 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 the echo wave comes back and brings about the gamma wave again, right? So you can see it sort of does this kind of business, okay? And this is the slower wave, okay? Again, same idea, okay? This is same mouse, same data, just filtered into different ways, okay? And here we have it, okay? So this rotating wave front that sweeps kind of in this counterclockwise motion throughout the brain, okay? Alex, you know, this makes me think of um, Selene Adesoy's work on uh, mm -hmm. eigenvectors. And you know, yeah. in patterns in nature, including in brain waves. Uh, have you looked at her work and, and seen how it matched your new findings at all? I'm not very familiar. I know a little bit about this, but um, uh, what uh, the way we identify these waves on single channels is very, very closely related to eigenvectors, to okay. singular values and singular vectors, just because of how the data works. In the stability analysis, these are precisely eigenvectors. So yeah, it is, you know, it, it, the whole idea of a, you know, you know, eigen means proper, you know, proper vector. This is sort of the proper way to analyze uh, 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 these kinds of complex spatial temporal signals. Now, whether the brain does something akin to our eigen decomposition, I don't know. It would be awfully convenient if it did. I imagine it, it's some kind of a messy version of, of, of that, but yes, but, uh, that's right. So uh, uh, these uh, individual waves on a single trial, those are singular modes, which, you know, unless you really want to nerd out about the math of this is very similar to what you would call eigenmodes as well. Got it. Okay, so we talked a little bit about this, but this whole process actually repeats several times, phase locked to the wave of the slower oscillation, okay? And uh, as, as Tam said, uh, this was our thinking that, well, maybe the slow oscillation is a reflection of some synaptic volumes that arrive into a particular brain region. And this gamma higher frequency activity is maybe more related to the firing of neurons in that brain region. And again, because these are mice, but we can record uh, uh, firing of individual neurons. So this is an example of a very pretty neuron in the posterior parietal cortex, and this is another one in um, uh, uh, in V1. And you, again, you can see I sort of mentioned that the spike is about one millisecond. Well, you can see the calibration bar here is half a millisecond. So this is 
this is a very tiny and very fast blip. Okay, so what I'm plotting for you here is a uh, hundred trials or so in which we recorded this particular neuron. Okay, and uh, this is uh, the green line is the stimulus. Okay, and uh, the red squiggly line is the slow. Okay, and you can see quite quite clearly that across trials, neuron firing is incredibly synchronous. Right, it occurs at more or less the same time in every single trial. And it is also very, very tightly coupled to the phase of the slow oscillation. Okay? And the same kind of phenomenon, although noisier, occurs in the PPU. Okay? And this is, we didn't just pick these neurons for fun. Uh, this was very, very common. So here, for every neuron that we recorded, okay, we're plotting in color the probability that it fired as a function of phase of the slow oscillation. And you can see that different neurons prefer different phases. They don't all fire at the peak or at the top or whatever. They each have a phase that they like, but a lot of them have a preferred phase. In, in, in other words, a lot of neurons were modulated by the slow wave. So as the wave uh, hits a particular brain region, there is also a temporal sort of sequence of spikes where each spike fires at its own preferred phase. Okay? All right, so, and then now to tie it all together, the basic premise is that like, okay, if this neuron in V1 is dancing to this beat, and this one in PPA, totally different brain region, is also dancing to more or less the same beat, they ought to be connected, right? right? Because as we have shown that this, it's not that there are two separate waves, the blue and the red one, is that they're both components of the same oscillation. Spatial temporal oscillation. Okay, so if that is the case, that's what we should expect, and we shouldn't expect this before the stimulus because we're very, very unlikely to pick out two neurons that happen to be physically connected to each other. You know, we're you know we're just lucky to record some neurons, and the connectivity between the primary visual cortex and the PA is very, very weak. So the chance of two neurons being synaptically coupled is very weak. So these are all the different pairs of V1 and PPA neurons right before the stimulus. And again, I hope you can see that there's really no relationship. But after the stimulus, okay, it's a different story, is that there's a strong tendency for neurons to fire at more or less the same time. And you can, Alex, if you're yeah, yeah, go ahead. A couple of questions there. So is this a visual illusion? I, I think I see some kind of um, line in the first diagram. Yeah, there's a, like a very there's weak a link. Weak yeah, yeah. There's, okay. there's a weak tendency for sure. If you plotted sort of this average across uh, all neurons, it will be almost flat. It won't be perfectly flat. Almost, because, okay. you know, well, even before the stimulus, the brain is doing something. Again, we just don't know what that is, right? Right. Yeah, I don't know what echo. I was thinking about. That's right. But, yeah. you know, uh, uh, so there is some very, very weak tendency, but uh, this is definitely a lot stronger. Right? And then in and, terms of the second image and your, your clear signal there, um, mapping cross or interneuronal correlations. Is this yes. the ECOG, ECOG in a particular neuron, or is it basically the ECOG electrode that you're assuming is relating to a particular very neuron? Very good question. Okay, very good question. So, uh, uh, right. So the surface waves was re were recorded with an electrode placed on the surface. These electrodes will not pick up spikes. So in addition to the surface electrodes, we put through the cortex what's called a linear microelectrode array. It's a silicon shank that contains many, 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 many electrodes across its uh, length. And what uh, we are doing is we are uh, picking up cells throughout the cortical column, approximately, right? So these different things denote different cortical layers, right? So this is, uh, this is the input layer from the thalamus comes into the core. Layer five neurons, uh, if you remember Matthew Larkham's talk, are the ones that are very closely engaged with cortical, cortical communications and so the superficial cortical layers. So when we're looking here, uh, the phase of this wave was the wave that was extracted from the same electrode where the spike was, okay? So this is in the cortex, not superficial, okay? Does that uh, actually make sense? But here, yeah. what we're doing, there is no wave here at all. This is the time of the PTA spike is on the X, and on the Y, 
is probability that the neuron in the visual cortex fired as a function of time relative to the PPE spike. So this shows that these, uh, after the stimulus, neurons in V1 and in the PPE appear to be correlated, right? There is no more wave in here. The wave is gone, right? We're saying if both of these cells are coordinated by the same wave, they should be coordinated to each other and that's what they're claiming in this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And you can also see a little bit on the edges here, you see that there's a peak in this correlation, that's good. Then there's a clear trough, but then there is a peak again, because, and if you look at this, this is 200 milliseconds, one fifth of a, of, a, of a second. So that's roughly five hertz. So that's where the next crest of the wave would appear. Right? So these correlations are written. They appear and they dissipate and they appear. Okay. Good. So this is basically uh, the summary of what I was hoping to convince you in the awake brain, uh, right? Uh, okay, so there are these two waves, they go in opposite directions, they involve different frequencies and they appear, these are not, you know, I don't know what you guys think about this, but you know, some people would say that, well, these waves are epiphenomenal. They don't themselves do anything. Right, they're sort of an echo, like the noise that the engine makes uh, as the brain is uh, doing their thing, but they do reflect some physiological processes that actually impact individual neurons, right? And we're trying to claim this based on the fact that neurons become correlated with each other and to the wave. Fair enough? On the, on the point very quickly, Alex, um, I'm sure you saw the big paper came out in, I think, 2019, Channing et al, looking at brain organoids and then severing all neuronal connections and then finding strong correlations between the severed halves still. So that That's kind right. of is pretty definitive data that there is a physiological role here for the EM field phenomena, right? Yeah, the, the, that's right. And uh, the, 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 there are, um, you know, you know the, this debate goes on like forever, <laughs> okay? Like, uh, I think there's also uh, very nice uh, examples of this uh, in all places in a fish uh, where you can actually manipulate the fields, record the fields and show that the field around the cell actually impacts the cell. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not really going to weigh in on this. I do think that, you know, it matters a lot what you're recording, you know, like, uh, you know, I don't know if the specific field that we are recording has direct effects on the cells, but it is a reflection of something that does. You know, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? That, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, neurons are sensitive to electric fields. So uh, I, I don't think that's that far-fetched. Okay. So, uh, but uh, I, nothing that I said has anything to do with perception, okay, because well, and actually nothing that I will say will definitively look to anything that I said with perception, except for uh, this very sort of well-known fact that, you know, you can show a stimulus that is too weak. And uh, if you ask a person whether they saw something, they would say no. Or you, you can do a variety of other tricks to the stimulus to make them inaccessible to, uh, to the subject, okay? So, uh, uh, and as you increase the, uh, the strength of the stimulus, for instance, you will increase the probability of getting a response, okay? So while well, we played this game, when we started uh, varying uh, the strength of the stimulus, and uh, you can see that the feed forward wave looks unchanged. It doesn't care about the strength of the stimulus at all, but the feedback wave uh, incredibly uh, uh, senses of the strength of the stimulus is that here it occupies just a small part of the brain. And as you cross a threshold in brightness, it seems to envelop much of the brain. And uh, furthermore, once it sort of booms, it doesn't really change afterwards. A nice thing about this is that, and this is not based on our work, we didn't do any behavior in this study, we're just gearing up to do that. But if you believe what is published, the threshold for perception for a mouse is roughly between these two intensity levels. So the claim here is that this feedback wave acts in a way that resembles psychophysics. Okay, so maybe this uh, fast feed forward business is not really closely related to perception, but this big feedback wave 
maybe is. Okay. Good. The time check, Alex. We have about ten minutes left. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, well, uh, this will be very quick because now we just have to show you what the anesthetics do. So we looked at different anesthetics. Some of them really change the resting EEG, like isoflurane produces these slow oscillations. Well, like ketamine. I hope you remember my, my subject who was out of this world on ketamine. Okay, but doesn't really change EEG. You can see those are quite similar. Okay, but uh, uh, you can take my word on this because I don't really have time. The feet forward wave was pretty much the same under all anesthetic conditions. The feet back wave was not. Okay, and this is the same mouse exposed to all the three different conditions uh, to stimuli of different intensity. And I hope uh, uh, it's fairly convincing that in the anesthetized brain, uh, the, uh, uh, the slow wave behaves for strong stimuli in the way that it does for subthreshold stimuli. Okay? And if uh, we are right in that the slow wave entrains neurons, then we shouldn't see any entraining in the anesthetized brain. And that seems to be the case. So uh, again, neurons recorded from the same mouse under three different conditions. Here again, you can see that the spikes are entrained to the wave here, here, and here. Uh, you can see that cells fire, cells re brain responds to stimuli in the anesthetized brain, certainly in the visual cortex, we get a nice uh, bump in the firing rate, uh, same business goes here, but it's no longer entrained to the wave. And that's why when we look at, did I show you this? I, didn't, I forgot this, but you can again take my word on this. And therefore, if you plotted the correlation between V1 and PPA under anesthesia, you would get none. You would get baseline conditions. I don't have time to show you this, but I will just tell you that this is very tantalizing to speculate. I'm not going to claim this as a finding, is that there is a lot of feedback wave, the slow wave under ketamine. And there are a lot of neurons entrained to the wave under ketamine, but they're not entrained to the stimulus. So an interesting conjecture is that while maybe experience in and of itself, regardless of whether it is connected to the stimulus, Right, it may be, maybe there's an equivalent of mouse hallucination. I don't know, it's very, very hard to tell. But if there was, you would hope that it would be associated with similar kind of phenomena as perception of your simile. So uh, maybe I should just end here because I don't really have that much to say, except for there is a very close connection to the really nice work by Peter Rolfsman and Sandra Hayden. I think came out in science uh, 2018 or 2019 or so, where they showed that there is this ignition-like event that distinguishes trials in which, uh, in their case, a monkey was able to respond to a threshold stimulus and the one where it was not. And, uh, uh, and this ignition sort of related to synchronization of uh, different parts of the brain. So our hope is, or our maybe hypothesis is that maybe this synchronizing event, this ignition-like event, is the feedback wave or something like that. Okay, so that's kind of where we stand. And of course, uh, DC did most of the work on this project, and she had help from two amazing undergrads who stayed on after she defended. That's commitment. And they're trying to, try, trying to work out the behavior of her. They're amazing. OK, and thank you guys very much for inviting me. Well, thanks. Alex, that's really interesting work. And um, if I can just kind of flesh out your your last um, suggestion, which you I think you you know appropriately um, caveated, saying it's not a finding, but kind of more speculation at this point. So, are are you saying essentially that um, anesthetics destroy the feedback slower carrier waves and thereby destroy uh, whole brain functional integration? Is that just a really simple way of saying your kind of main speculation? This is what I would say for isoflurane. If you look at isoflurane, that wave is just gone. Okay, under ketamine, so isoflurane is not thought to give rise to these kinds of hallucinations, dissociated states, but ketamine does. Okay? And in ketamine, there is a lot of feedback wave. There's a lot of it, and it synchronizes neurons, but it's unaffected by the stimulus. So maybe this has to do, you know, in general perception in a normal state involves both the feed forward flow of information through the senses and also the feedback uh, uh, from other cortical areas, including onto primary, primary sensory cortices and whatnot. And it seems like under ketamine, this bias is really 
weight heavily towards feedback, where the animal is maybe perceiving, thinking, experiencing something, but that something is wholly unconnected to what is in the outside world. And that's our conjecture for a dissociated state where, as my subject here said, well, he had hallucinations, he thought he was floating, he, the faces were speaking. So it's, it's this very bizarre state where maybe some information from the outside world filters, but uh, uh, not that much. So Thank you. does that sort of answer your question? It does, yeah. And we have time for a few more questions, so please feel free to chime in if you have questions. Alex, um, I, I'm wondering how this relates. There's a number of theories which talk about a thalmocortical loop. And I'm wondering it, to what degree this is building on those or is, is the thalamus not that, that important for it? So how would you relate this to that, those kind of theories? So we're working on this. I think it's really important, okay? Uh, so what I didn't show you is that um, uh, the gamma wave is initiated, the feed forward wave is initiated in the layer four of the cortex. Layer four is the thalamic input layer. Okay, we're not the first ones to show it. Peter Rolfsma has really nice papers in primates showing very similar things. Now, the feedback wave originates in the superficial layers of the cortex and descends down into the guts of the cortex. So traditionally, the superficial cortical layers are home for cortical cortical connectivity. But that's not true. <laughs> it is true, but it's not the whole story because uh, the thalamus interacts with the cortex in two fundamentally different ways, the, the core and the matrix. Uh, uh, the matrix projects and neurons also go into the superficial cortical layers. And rather than conventional sort of thalamic relay systems, these uh, neurons that live in, in thalaminar nuclei and whatnot, uh, they're thought to be related more to states of arousal and their physiological role is to provide broad innovation to the cortex and sort of help synchronize this activity. So uh, just to put a bow on it, I think that uh, uh, this, uh, sorry, let me just find, yeah, you see this kind of curvature that mm -hmm. means mm -hmm. that the, the phase relationships are not linear, which probably means that the delays between different oscillators occur on different time scales. And what I dream about is that these are the contributions from cortical cortical and cortical thalamic cortical loops. So disentangling these is a highly non-trivial business. But I, you know, if you want to take this as evidence uh, uh, of multiple pathways being involved, I think it's it's intriguing. It's suggestive. You know, I wouldn't hang my hat on it. Uh, but yes, I, I do think that. Uh, uh, it is very likely that both cortical cortical and cortical thalamic cortical loops will be involved in this. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, of course. I have a sort of artsy question. Um, and that's what I do is try and translate certain theories of consciousness into uh, sound experiences, um, sort of mapping the elements of sound onto what's happening, say, with brainwave states. Yeah. And I couldn't help but. Uh, that there is the image where you showed it with some violet color, the movement of a gamma wave. Uh -huh. And I was curious if, if that is a like depiction at the size of how it would be, if you were to feel it vibrationally happening in your own brain, would that movement sort of be about life size when it comes to the slide that you have? Or is it like uh -huh. a smaller cycle? Um, well, uh... This is the life size, meaning life size for a month. That, this one. <laughs> right. So <laughs> these, are, these are units of millimeters. So this this whole thing is about four millimeters, and this whole thing is about two and a half millimeters, which is roughly the dimensions of a grid of electrodes on the mouse. So yeah, this is this is obviously you know, like I don't know if you've uh, played with mice to get candy. If I showed you in real life size. It wouldn't be a very interesting slide. <laughs> but, yeah, they are definitely life size uh, for a mouse. And I think they're very pretty, actually. They're very kind of, I don't know, I, I find these kind of patterns visually appealing. I don't know if that just speaks of something about me or about the brain. That, that That's hard for me to say. But they kind of look like these, uh, especially this one. It's easier to see because it's slower, right? It's sort of kind of. Locates like this. It's 
almost like a lava lamp or something like that. Yeah, so my, this yeah. is what, when I close my eyes or keep my eyes open, I basically see this same undulation yeah. of a, uh, so I was wondering if it's possible that the synest a synesthetic relationship with brainwave states could develop if a person is that well, interested. You know, uh, the, the, the way this project started, uh, was um, in, in a weird way connected to synesthesia, but more directly connected to multisensory integration, right? And, you know, what I guess a psychologist would call a binding problem, uh, a neuroscientist would, would call multisensory integration. The whole point is that, like, that we study a brain one region at a time, but in the real world, uh, we don't see that. Uh, when we experience a thing, it comes to us from multiple senses. So how is this information integrated in the brain? And the idea was that maybe if we found these large spatial temporal patterns and we could combine say inputs to different sensory modalities, we will find some very interesting interferences between these waves, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe, you know, you can think of synesthesia as some sort of a, you know, a difference in how these, these patterns interact with one another turned out to be really hard to work with a simple single stimulus. So we're not quite there, but uh, yeah, uh, you know, these are kind of very organic shapes. They feel like this is, yeah, it also looks similar to me when I close my eyes and, uh, you know, like you stare at something, you say, it kind of looks like this. I, you know, I, I can't speculate on, you know, if these two phenomena are related, but I think, you know, at least, Mathematically, they probably are because there are probably very few things that give rise to these kinds of shapes. Certainly, not everything. These are not really waves. The waves don't look like this. If I show you a picture of a wave, it won't right. look like that at all. It's more like blobs that rotate. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anyone else? All right. Well, thanks so much, Alex. It's really interesting thanks presentation. So much, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. I'll, uh, uh, I sent you the uh, bioarchive version of the paper. Mm -hmm. uh, the data, there's reviewers tortured us a fair bit, as probably you guys are well familiar with this process. So uh, the real paper has more things in it. Uh, I'll I have to find the latest PDF. I'm happy to share it. It doesn't have any anesthesia data in it. But it has sort of the, a lot more than what I said about uh, the brain. And then a seizure paper was still uh, writing. And uh, you know, uh, I'll let you know when we put it out in archive and all that. Yeah, thanks so much, Santa. Sure. Thanks again. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Sure. bye. Thank you, Alex. Great presentation. Sure. Thank you. Bye. Bye. On behalf of the entire General Residence Theory team, I'd like to thank you for watching. Don't forget to like this video, share it, add a comment, and subscribe for more content. We'll see you next time.